Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? That's good and loud. So yeah, so they're going to keep that picture up for this whole speech. <laughs> You know what? That picture was taken four years ago, and I refused to uh, get a retake because I figured it was a really good picture, and I'm never going to look like that again. So I've used it like for four years, but recently um, the media have asked for a new picture because they don't want to use that one anymore. They think it's too used, and and I was like, but but why? <laughs> why can't we just keep it? So yeah, I after four years of that picture, I was forced to retake you know, my picture, and it didn't turn out as good as this one, and now I'm so sad, right? So I'm so kind of glad. This is the last hurrah for this picture. Let's all look at it fondly, because this may be the last time, you'll, you know, people will be using it. So I, I want to thank Anita for inviting me here on behalf of the, um, the Race Relations Foundation. I'm, you know, it's so interesting for me, because I consider myself a comedy writer, and to be in this room and to hear, you know, eloquent speeches from people who are in the business of race relations is been really powerful for me, and I always, I often wonder why, you know, I get chosen to come and speak to people because I tend to get my foot into it a lot um, when it comes to a lot of issues. I grew up in Toronto and moved to Saskatchewan about 20 years ago, and that's when I first started learning about First Nations for the first time in my life, and when it became you know, when it became the tradition to acknowledge the territories we were on, I would, you know, I'm from Territory 4, Treaty 4, in, which is known as Regina, Saskatchewan, and, you know, Saskatoon is Treaty 6. And so, I, you know, I would come to Ontario and I would meet a member of First Nations, I would say, and so what's the number of your treaty, right? And so I would confuse people and, you know, I had a really gentle elder pull me aside and say, listen, you don't know the history of First Nations in Canada. Not everyone got to have a treaty and you're starting to confuse people because they're thinking you have some hidden knowledge about the treaty status of First Nations. And so this has been really interesting, the whole dynamic of what it's like moving you know, migration and how that affects your understanding and learning about the history of this country. And when I was asked to reflect on the conference, I thought every person in this room comes to this conference and hears what people are saying through their own lens and through their own experience, their own human lived experience. So I thought, what, what is my human lived experience? You know, and ultimately colonialism shapes the person that I am because I would say my journey here in front of you today began really in 1947. That was the time in India where my father lived. He was 15 years old and he had neighbors who were Sikhs and Muslims and Hindus and they lived in relative you know, peace and you know, plurality in that time period and then the British had come in with colonialism and had decided they were going to split India into two countries. Indi you know, Pakistan for Muslims and India for Hindus. And my father said, like, overnight, everything changed, right? Neighbors that had, you know, who they had been neighbors forever, you know, for centuries. Neighbors started killing each other. Violence broke out. You know, they had to, they moved, you know, they had a home. They had stability. They had factories. They had, you know, financial, you know, they had financial stability, and overnight they became refugees instantly in their own land, and they had to be sent to refugee camps and then put on trains that you know were, were crossing the border into what was then Pakistan. And sometimes, you know, people would be slaughtered on these trains before they even reached their destination. So it was like a really frightening time in his life, and he always remembers that you know that where peace, where you can live in peace with your neighbors, and one day in a heartbeat it can just disappear, and you can never, ever take that for granted. And then their family plunged into poverty, you know, when they were in Pakistan, because they had lost everything, and they had to start from scratch from the beginning. And he became obsessed with education. How does one get out of poverty? Because you, everything can be taken from you, right? Your land, your factories, you know, everything that your family held dear, but what no one could take was your education. So he became obsessed with education. He became an engineer, and then ironically moved to the very country that had caused the problem in the first place, because England was looking for engineers to rebuild. And so he ended up moving to the UK and sending money home to help his you know, younger brothers and sisters. And then, when family reunification became more difficult in England, he migrated once again to Canada because Canada was looking for educated immigrants. So it was a story of three migrations which brought me here to Canada. And I was his only daughter. And it was so interesting. I have two younger brothers. But that upheaval that had happened in his life, what he had seen was that all his younger sisters and all the female 
um, relatives, they had been married as teenagers, very, very young, because the families were worried about instability, and this was one way of keeping women safe. But in his mind, what had happened was he had seen women who didn't fulfill their potential as human beings because they had to marry so young and have children. And he felt that it, it became fused in his mind growing up, right? So as his only daughter, what I would hear day and night was, what's bad for women is men and marriage and babies. <laughs> Only if you can get a really good education and make money and become independent financially, there's no reason to get married. Marriage is for women who fail, right? <laughs> this was a mantra I was growing up with, right? So, I mean, if a woman came to her house, the first thing he always asked was, well, what kind of education do you have? If she had a BSc right away, uh, if she hadn't married him, she, she could have got her master's. Or if she had her master's, if she hadn't married him, she could have got her PhD. If she had her PhD, if she hadn't married him, she could have been president of the World Bank. It was it never mattered what she got if she just hadn't married this man, this useless man who can barely read or write. I mean, it was such a strange way to grow up. It was like as if being, if I, it was as if I was being raised by Gloria Steinem, except you know she was a male and conservative Pakistani and Muslim, right? My mother hated these conversations because she always felt that you know I was getting a really negative impression of men. But in that time period, what it did was it made me realize how important education and female empowerment was. But he also raised me as a very strong Muslim. You know, I went to mosque every week. And so strangely, sort of that feminism was starting to be fused with faith. And when one day a curtain came down in the mosque and we were told as women we had to pray behind a curtain because, you know, women and sexuality, we were attracting the men and we were distracting them, it really, really upset me. And I thought, no, this can't be the faith that I was brought into as a strong woman. And so I made a documentary called Me in the Mosque and that documentary was in, was in itself inspired by a Jewish documentary called Half My Kingdom, which was about Jewish feminists who were also struggling with patriarchy and misogyny in their culture. And that's when it dawned on me that misogyny and sexism um, and patriarchy isn't based in faith groups. It's based, it's a universal principle that transcends all cultures and all faiths. And that we as women and men have to ally ourselves together and fight these issues. And so from that, from that, from that, from the, those forces that sort of came together um, to form me, it was from there I realized that I wanted to do social advocacy work and issues when it came to um, the empowerment of women. And so then where does one go from that? And I, and, I, and I was asked to speak on the reflections on all I heard today. And it reminded me of a verse in the Quran, and I'm going to paraphrase. Um, and when paraphrasing from the Quran, I would just say, don't try this at home, <laughs> right? So there's, there's this verse that, we, that comes down with the angels, right? So the angels are creatures that bow down to God and, and they worship God all the time and, and you know, they, glor you know, they um, talk about God's glory. And so suddenly they're very dismayed one day when they realize humans are about to be created, right? And so that they ask God, but why? <laughs> These people are going to create bloodshed and war and kill each other and we're, we are creatures that worship you. Like why would you create them? Like what good could they possibly do on earth? And God's answer is so simple. God says, I know what you know not. And that's it. And then and for centuries, scholars have asked, well, what did God know about human beings? And when I was listening to everyone speaking today at all of different panels, it occurred to me that's what God was talking about, is that people are talking about each other. How do we live together? How can we live in peace? How do we overcome our differences? And each one of you was saying something in your own way, which adds to the human experiment of plurality, how we can live together with different skin colors and geographies and faiths and orientations, and yet overcome our differences and live in peace, which is a very, very difficult experiment um, that exists here on Earth. And in order to overcome our barriers, it's to understand story and to get to know each other and to know our, each other's history. And that was something that I had learned the hard way when I first moved to Saskatchewan. When I married my husband, I wanted to work at the CBC and there was this little tiny radio station in La Ronge. Has anyone ever heard of La Ronge in Saskatchewan? So it's a town seven hours north of Regina. This is the place I went to. And I, so I've lived my entire life in Ontario, more or less in Toronto. And so 
I get married, and this is the first place I moved to. It's this tiny, tiny town, seven hours north of Virginia. And I, you know, we drive up there. And this is the first time I've had any experience meeting members of First Nations in my entire life, right? This is where the LaRange Indian Band lives, which is the biggest First Nations community in Saskatchewan. And I remember getting out of the car and walking, and you know, and people are looking at me, right? This brown woman wearing this bright hijab, and you know, and I'm looking at these brown people, and we're, you know, we're both looking at each other, going, "Who are you?" And you know, and both of us are called Indians. One of us for the wrong reason, <laughs> and it was, that was my experience with First Nations. And I remember. That very first night, there was a suicide of a young person, and it, was, it shocked me to the core that this was happening. That was my first introduction, the cultural genocide of the First Nations community. It had never, I had never known about the history of First Nations in Canada, and I started to learn about it. And what had happened was that 20 years later, I was at a CBC radio station in Windsor, Ontario, talking about the elections that we just had, where our Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, was talking to people about cultural barbaric values and how he was attaching those to the Muslim community and ratcheting up the whole xenophobic fear in this country. And I remember rem mentioning on CBC Radio, I said, you know, when I first learned about the cultural genocide of the First Nations community that happened 200 years ago in this nation, our Prime Minister then, John A. MacDonald, would talk about cultural barbaric practices of First Nations and how they had to be removed by removing language and culture and history from children of First Nations. And today, 200 years later, we hear the same words from another prime minister in Canada. So how much have we really learned? And these were the words that I spoke and that were heard by Lynn Akus, who is the chief of the Sakine Nation in Regina. And she heard me. And when I came back to Saskatchewan, she said, you know, I'd like to invite you to a sweat ceremony. And I said, oh yeah, for sure. I'll, you know, I, I wanna make contact and I wanna be part of the rituals and learn more about First Nations. And so in Saskatchewan, we have First Nations University and there was, this, you know, there, so they had built, um, what you call a sweat lodge, and, and so I went, and you know, they had the rocks and the water, and I had not a clue, like not a clue of what was happening, right? And so I didn't even bother doing any research, and so when I went into the, the sweat lodge, I realized that I had failed to mention that I have like a fear of enclosed spaces. <laughs> And so then I was like, okay, well, this is not the right time to maybe mention it because it was a very sacred moment. And I remember looking at the flap that they had open and I thought I will survive if I just breathe and they don't close that flap and I just concentrate, right? And so, you know, a young man started talking about his experiences and the difficulties he was having and then they closed the flap, right? And that's when I had like my panic attack and I'm like, oh my God, in the most sacred moment, you could see someone crawling across everyone's laps going, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And I like flopped out of the sweat lodge and this elder is looking at me. He's like, you had no idea, did you? <laughs> I said, no, I'm so sorry. Right? He's like, it's good to be part of other people's cultures, but we have to also do it with you know, more respect and more education and inform ourselves because sometimes we go headlong into other people's cultures without understanding what the implications of our actions are. So from that um, experience, I decided that I would make a television show from, called Little Mosque on the Prairie. And part of the reason for that was in order to teach each other about ourselves, we have to expose each other to other cultures through media because media is one of the strongest forms of telling each other stories because not all of us can meet each other everywhere, but the most scalable way of spreading culture is through the media. And so, you know, I have a difficult relationship with my Muslim community at times because of my activism when it comes to gender rights and female emancipation. So for me, it was about feminism and talking about female rights in mosques. And that was the impetus for making the show. And you know, when you belong to your own community, you feel there are no bigger whack jobs that can possibly exist than the people that you live with. But what surprised me the most was that after the show started airing, 
people started coming up to me and saying, oh my God, you know, people in my synagogue or people in my temple or people in my church, that's exactly the same people that I have, right? And I'm like, really? And then even people who didn't belong to faith organizations, like the soccer association, they would say we had the same debate of you know, usurping the president and our soccer association that you had on an episode last week. And that's when I started to realize that by making something so culturally specific, I had tapped into something universal. Right? That all human beings that belong to any organization have exactly the same problems and the same social dynamics. I hadn't actually come up with anything original or new. The same stories had been told over and over again in some other iteration about some other community. It's just we had never seen Muslims doing that. I had humanized a community that had never been allowed to be human in the media before. They had always been seen as the terrorist or the scary oppressive other on the news. And now suddenly we were just paying our bills and raising our kids and just being people. And that's what the biggest story for me was that it was the story of being human and that all of us, essentially want exactly the same thing, right? We just want a safe place to live. We want our kids to get through university or some sort of education where they can make their own money and not live in our basements, right? And we, we just want a peaceful existence and being able to pay our bills and being able to have neighbors that are safe, that we can feel safe with. At the end of the day, these are the issues that affect all of us and we have a common humanity. And and so what I wanted to tell you was that for each one of us, what I wish for is the same thing that my father had hoped for for me, was that each one of us, despite whatever skin color we are, or the geography, or faith, or gender, or orientation, what we all want is to be able to fulfill our human potential to the greatest we can possibly do in the circumstances that we have had without any impediment, and to be able to give that to our children and to our neighbors and to our community and to our country. And that's really the story of being human. And that's the story that I learned coming here and listening to all of you speak, was about how each one of you is trying to bridge that gap and bring more peace and understanding and harmony to our world. Thank you very much.